What is up, everyone? Brandon First, a.k.a. First Report, representing the first Off the Bench podcast network. Everyone comes off the bench. We are first. Welcome in to a special edition of the original Call to Post. We are essentially one week out from Thoroughbred Racing, uh, the the Super Bowl of Thoroughbred Racing, or, or maybe the better term would be World Championship of thoroughbred racing it is of course the breeders cup we are going to take kind of a behind the scenes look at the event and of course when i say we i mean myself and my friend and co-host raider jim martinez you can find mr martinez at raider jim 1090 how you doing tonight sir hey i'm doing great this is a good time of year it doesn't matter what your football teams are doing as we said the other day we're halfway through the football season we've got ncaa basketball coming up First and foremost, though, we have the highlight of thoroughbred racing just one week away. It's a great, exciting time. Yeah, it is a fantastic time for, you know, obviously um, fans of the sport, for the horse players slash handicappers. Um, but also, I think for the connections for a lot of these horses, um, the one thing that I, I really enjoy about the Breeders' Cup, and of course, it's in the name, but... Um, you know, the telecast and and uh, the events, they really highlight the breeders, um, the the people that are definitely doing kind of the uh, the dirty work um, so that, you know, we see these two, three, four and obviously older horses be able to compete. Um, it's not as simple as uh, introducing two horses uh, to each other and hoping that nature runs its course, uh, I guess, you know, in, in some ways. It is that simple, but after the fact, um, you know, going through all that, and I, I really do like the Breeders' Cup. They do highlight the breeders' side of it, uh, something I think it's overlooked a lot of the time, and that's kind of what this podcast is going to be about. Obviously, we did already do our kind of early look at the Breeders' Cup without any, um, you know, true entries or any PPs. Uh, from, you know, getting everything together. And, uh, you know, we are recording on Thursday, the 26th of October. And I did see that we have some pre-entries. Um, yes. But by the time we speak next Thursday or Wednesday, whenever we get that rolling, um, we are going to uh, have kind of that final um, idea of of how everything's going to shake out. So that will be for next week. But like I said, this episode not really um, any gambling side of things. Just some of the fun facts, some of the history, some of the things, like I said, that we that kind of go on behind the scenes to make this event not only go, but go at the quality and level that it needs to go at. Because as we said, not only are we talking about some of the best horses, some of the best jockeys, but this is the top of the top for the world. Um, I, I kind of said earlier, it's the the Super Bowl of horse racing. That's not really um, a, a fair comparison with all due respect to the Super Bowl because uh, football is not an international sport. Um, I can't imagine uh, the best Japanese football team could come and take down, um, you know, the probably the worst NFL team, uh, maybe some college teams. So it's more more like the Olympics, more like the world championships is obviously Europe has a heavy fingerprint on the event and lately we've seen japan kind of come on as well but raider jim um what are your thoughts obviously plenty of history and uh facts uh for the breeders cup oh so much history and you know me i just get into that kind of stuff uh you know we hit a bit a little bit on it last week when we were doing our regular talk about what races are coming up uh and again we can only talk about in a very broad range who's going to be running, who might be in this Breeders' Cup race, that Breeders' Cup race. Uh, I did mention that when uh, the inception came back in 1982, a gentleman named John R. Gaines had the idea during Derby Week. Now, John Gaines, and a lot of people just go, okay, John Gaines, a guy that was associated with horse racing. But if you've ever had dogs and pets, he was actually a big pet food mogul. So if you ever had a dog back in the 70s, 80s, and you fed them something called Gainsburgers, that's the guy. He is the guy. Put that one in your cap and win some money at a bar yeah. one day. Uh, you know me, I'm always going to come up with the most random things that you uh, 
it's kind of like MacGyver trivia for me. You know, someday you may need it and it's going to save your life. But he is the gentleman that got this whole thing started. And it has just really grown into, as we keep saying, and everybody knows, this is the world championship, if you will. Uh, Money-wise, it does not compete, of course, with uh, the big race out in Saudi Arabia in February. But still, that's a different ball game, uh, different pocketbooks, different things like that. Uh, but not to be uh, not to be sneezed at at all. This is still the world championship of racing. Definitely. Um, all of these races, uh, pretty much a bare minimum purse of a million dollars, culminating with the classic, um, which, of course, will be ran on that final race on Saturday. Uh, that's at six million. And um, of course, this uh, Breeders' Cup 2023 will be held at Santa Anita. Um, it is the uh, the track that has hosted the Breeders' Cup the most. Obviously, the West Coast in November is a pretty safe bet to not have to kind of worry um, about uh, weather or you know other things like that. So, um, and over the past few years, 2017 was the first time us here in San Diego were able to be uh, blessed with the Breeders' Cup. Big reason why Del Mar was kind of, um, uh, you know, purchased or at least acquired the Hollywood Park, which is now uh, essentially SoFi Stadium. But Hollywood Park had uh, the uh, the November slate here on the West Coast. And Del Mar, once Hollywood Park shut down, Del Mar not only picked that up, um, but also with the eye on the Breeders' Cup, and they have been rewarded with that. We did touch a little bit on the winning, uh, the winningest jockeys, owners um, last week. The one thing that really did jump out to me is only three horse, or excuse me, two horses have won um, three separate um, Breeders' Cup races, uh, and one really jumps out to me. Obviously, look, Beholder is arguably one of the greatest fillies to ever run at least you know uh this decade or at least this generation if you will from 2012 uh did win the juvenile fillies and then came back the next year um as a three-year-old to win the distaff uh and then you know essentially 14 15 didn't get it done but did get the job done in the distaff in the 2016 but um, Goldakova won the Breeders' Cup Mile three years in a row, 2008, 2009, and 2010. Um, really, really impressive to see not only that horse run in a Breeders' Cup race to be at that level three years in a row, but to also win um, a very competitive division. Uh, the mile has always been a very competitive division. And quick little background as well, if you're you know just kind of getting into it. Uh, the, the the breakdown for the Breeders' Cup, obviously, Future Star Friday will be the two-year-olds. And then Saturday is the open, at least age groups, uh, three-year-olds and up. Do have a few, uh, you know, Philly and Mare's turf that will be uh, gender um, specific. But the Breeders' Cup, as I said, it is all about not only the breeders, the trainers, the jockeys, but mainly the thoroughbreds. You are getting the best of the best. And it's fantastic, but it also makes it so difficult to handicap these races because you're seeing a lot of horses that normally would be going off three, four to one, um, or even lower than that as favorites. They're going to be, you know, sniffing 10, 12 to one. You know, if you're running in the mile and your name is not Cody's Wish, uh, more than likely you're going to be five to one or up. Um, but 25% of the favorites have won in the Breeders' Cup history. That kind of jumped out to me. Um, obviously, that that also says 75% of the time you got a lot of chance to make some value there. Yeah, and but, you talk about horses that have accomplishments or thoroughbreds, I should say. I almost kind of hate to call them horses because it's like calling, uh, yeah. you, you know, th these are thoroughbreds. They're professionals out there. They are the stars of the game. Uh, you talked about the horses that have won, you know, three in a row, uh, two in a row, multiple years. Only one horse in the running of the Breeders' Cup and the Breeders' Cup Classic. Only one horse has won the Triple Crown and the Breeders' Cup Classic all in the same year, 2015. And that was American Pharaoh, the Grand Slam of thoroughbred racing. Only horse or first horse to do it. And I don't believe that that has been uh, duplicated since. Uh, and, and that was a wide, in true American Pharaoh fashion, won the Breeders' Cup Classic wire to wire. 
never was challenged. You know, what, what a fantastic run that was. And, and you, the money, the money that's out there, folks. Again, do we touch the money, the purses out in Saudi Arabia? No, but uh, we don't do bad. There's going to be 14 races over the course of the two days. Total purses are going to be $28 million. You've got uh, you've got six purses of a million, six purses of two million, a $4 million purse, and of course, the big one of the day, the granddaddy of them all, that Breeders' Cup Classic coming in at $6 million. And to give you an idea of what that means, everything contingent upon how many entries, of course, uh, last year's payout on the Breeders' Cup Classic, the $6 million race, the last person to get paid got 60 grand. <laughs> and then it went 120, 180, 300,000, 540,000 to the show horse, 1.02 million for the place horse, and the winner's circle got 3.1 million dollars. That's not bad for two and a half minutes of work, let me tell you. And that is why this is such a prestigious, prestigious event. Yeah, and I'm just checking it now. Um, obvious, um, the the situation, you know, 19, what was it, 1984 was the first Breeders' Cup, correct? Correct. Okay, so um, unfortunately, uh, American Pharaoh um, was the one of two horses that had a chance to do it justified also. I mean, did win the Triple Crown. However, if you remember the story of justified, there was a positive drug test. Um, essentially the, uh, Belmont was the last time we saw justified run, um, just with kind of all that stuff that ended up going down. So didn't get a chance to run for the grand slam, but technically the only horse that's gotten a chance to run for the grand slam has, uh, won that. And of course, American Pharaoh, I think just by the sheer, sheer dominance, um, you probably have to say is arguably the greatest horse we've seen, at least since secretariat. Now, for me personally, I, I go back to last year and um, I think it would have been, I, I think Tis Now record would have been possibly in doubt because if we would have seen Flightline running in this year's Breeders' Cup Classic, uh, it would have been hard to see any horse after what we saw that horse do, not only last year in the Breeders' Cup, but really all season. Now, Flightline was a three-year-old, but for whatever reason, I don't quite know of it top of my head. Didn't end up, you know, running in the Derby. I think it had a late start to the season overall. Um, but I'll never forget that Pacific Coast, uh, the Pacific Classic here at Del Mar, where I've never seen a horse dominate at Del Mar like that and at that level. And then kind of doubled down um, at last year's Breeders' Cup. But I think overall, the Breeders' Cup for me, it's kind of a small microcosm for how NFL the NFL season goes because – Friday is going to start. It's going to be the first Breeders' Cup, and you're going to have your your notes and all that stuff, and it's going to be five, six, seven, eight pages, and you're like, oh, my gosh, so much horse racing. I can't wait. And once again, you blink, and they're putting the wreath um, around the Breeders' Cup Classic winner, and it's like, whoa, where'd that go? Uh, it, it goes by so quick, um, and it's so well ran, um, especially, you know, I, I, I'm not a huge fan of a lot of maybe, let's say, NBC Sports presentations. However, they do horse racing very well. I think everyone they bring in um, to kind of, you know, be, let's call them the talking heads, if you will. They're all very smart. They all bring something to the table. Um, and and I think that really helps because us as, you know, horse players, horse horse racing enthusiasts, whatever you would like to refer to yourself as, I, I think we should kind of start turning the perception from, look, everyone focused on the Derby, and I understand it. Um, let's put that type of focus to the casual fan on the Breeders' Cup because the Kentucky Derby is the fastest two minutes in sports. I understand that. Um, but the Breeders' Cup, that's the fastest, you know, 14 races in sports. And I think overall, if, um, you know, uh, the more of the casual fan – would kind of tune in or at least, you know, give that kind of same effort into the Breeders' Cup. And obviously it's a lot different. Look, uh, we, we don't have the, uh, the the longest attention spans, um, you know, th as a generation these days. So, uh, you know, a two-minute race is a lot easier to follow than 14 full races. But I just I, – I look at the Breeders' Cup and it's – it is the true championship of the world. You're seeing the best horses. And 30 – um, oh shoot, 
36 out of the 38 runnings of the Breeders' Cup, only two times have we not seen a international horse win a race. So that kind of just also goes in to speak to how the races, uh, the races kind of shake out. And I know um, the turf races, especially when we kind of talked about last week, um, you're going to see a lot of heavy European influences. Um, but other thoughts there, Raider Jim. Yeah, and you hit on the international horses or, or participation, and that has grown. And the Breeders' Cup in general, they have done well. They continually have looked at it, and I think they've got it fine-tuned to where they really like the calendar they have set up. It's going to be five Breeders' Cup races on Friday. The other nine, the big ones, if you will, are going to run on Saturday. It is a full card at Santa Anita. So they're actually going to have race one first post time is at 1130 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. They're going to run four races and then races five through nine will be the Breeders' Cup races. And then they'll even close out with one more race that's yet to be determined. Probably just, you know, a maiden claiming something like that. But how do you get to the Breeders' Cup is something else. And who really participates? This was a little uh, eye opening for me. Brandon and I are very tuned into the Breeders' Cup Challenge Series races that are held from California to Saratoga, you know, to New York and everywhere in between in the United States, a couple up there in, in uh, Woodbine, too, in Canada. In, in all, and we don't look at the numbers ahead of time, there's 41 Breeders' Cup Challenge Series races in just the United States, North America. That means... Whoever wins those races, you are guaranteed to get into some corresponding Breeders' Cup race on Breeders' Cup weekend. There are 39 international races. I had no idea. 11 countries, including Argentina, Brazil, Canada, Chile, England, France, Ireland, Japan, Peru, and other places in South America. That blew my mind. I did not realize it was that extensive. I knew that there were a few here and there. Uh, but to know that there were 39, so you have in all, you know, 80 horses or 80 thoroughbreds that have won these races and are invited. Last year, 2022, uh, there were 38 Breeders' Cup Challenge Series winners that competed at Keeneland. Seven won their respective races. And of course, it was, you know, Flightline won the classic. And that was uh, no surprise to anybody. Flightline was the one to beat and nobody could and then the other horses that are the other thoroughbreds that performed very, very well. Malathot won the Distaff. Elite Power won the BC, the Breeders' Cup Sprint. Forte ran, won the Juvenile. And Wonder Wheel won the Juvenile for Phillies. And then there were other races, of course. But, uh, you know, you, you read those $2 million races and the Breeders' Cup Classic. And again, that's the who's who of thoroughbred racing right there. Yeah. yeah. And that's interesting to me. Um, you know, South America, uh, to get, you know, a lot of those uh race Peru kind of jumped out to me because I mean, I'm not a, a an incredible um geographical mind, but I have to feel like uh that's that's at a pretty high elevation. Um so interesting kind well, of I don't know, a lot of things going on there. Um I mean I I'm going back to to when the Padres played um Giants or I forget who they played. They played them in Mexico City, and it was double oh, yeah, yeah. the altitude of Mile High. And you know Correct. we think, oh, Colorado is essentially the top of the world. Well, I know uh, Peru has a lot of uh, you know pretty high mountains there. I'm not saying that's you know they're they're running on top of a mountain, but I got to feel like uh, uh, they're pretty high up. So that's very interesting. And then obviously um, it, the the positives of winning those races is your your not only is your ticket punched, um, but you know, there are other financial incentives that'll kind of cover getting your horses there. This is, you know, for a lot of horses. Now, luckily, it's here on the West Coast. So a lot of West Coast horses, they'll take that. Hey, thanks. We, you know, um, but for for a lot of these horses, they're either at Santa Anita or they're going to take the trip up the five to get to Santa Anita here from Del Mar um, before they come back, uh, you know, for, for, for the winter session. But it's really interesting to the way the Breeders' Cup kind of breaks everything down. As you mentioned, the corresponding races. Um, and then also on top of that, they also, you know, doing my research, I didn't realize that they also give points out um, for grade one, grade two, and grade three races. Mm -hmm. There is a caveat to that. Those are only North America races or North American races. 
So a lot of these internationals, uh, horses, you're kind of just going to have to get on the eye test if you don't qualify, if you will. Um, but the other way, you know, very kind of similar to the, to the triple crown qualifications of the Kentucky Derby, you very accumulate yes. points if you don't get in there um, to those Breeders' Cups. So even the grade one, grade two, and grade three races, while they may not be Breeders' Cup challenge races, are still factored in, at least here in North America, another part of that as well. Um, those, so if you're a dirt horse, say you're a, you're a horse that wants to run in the dirt mile and earlier in the season, you ran in a grade two turf race that is not brought into it. Um, however, for two year olds, uh, it doesn't matter what surface you're on, um, the points, uh, accumulate regardless. So if you ran in a juvenile grade one, um, turf in May, uh, but you want to run on the dirt in the Breeders' Cup, the points from the turf do accumulate for the two-year-olds, not for the three-year-olds end up essentially the horses that are running on Saturday. So Yeah, very, very good because you're right. I've got that down in my notes because uh, it, it is basically almost uh, the same format as the Kentucky Derby, Derby points, except you will not see a grade one that you might get 100 points. Yeah, uh, instead, everything is grade oh, ones are 10, six and four, twos are six, four and two. And then the grade threes are four, two and one. And how that translates over to qualifying for a breed, help you qualify for the Breeders' Cup. I am really not sure of that, so I'm not going to speak to it. But going back to those challenge series winners, those people, those thoroughbreds that win the win and you're in races, along with getting a guaranteed entry into some designated race. Uh, they also receive, no matter where their home is, they will get $10,000 for the U.S. as a travel stipend for the U.S. horses. Doesn't matter where you're located, so that's an easy 10K if you're if you're hanging out down in Rancho Santa Fe and you just got to go up to five. And an international horse, which includes Canada, uh, you will get $40,000 for a travel stipend, which, you know, that that's also... Breeders' Cup really, really, really makes it inviting and makes it uh, affordable, if you will, to get your uh, horses out here. Next year, I think I want to dig into uh, what kind of insurance policies do these breeders and these owners carry? Because it's got to be big. Lloyd's of London must just be making it hand over fist with these horse owners. Yeah, um, I, obviously, we talk about it a lot, um, you know, throughout the year. Um, when we say, oh, this, this, this is only a purse of 250,000. Okay. Well, 250,000 to 98% of the people in this world is a lot of money in horse racing at the level we're talking about, not so much. So everything's kind of relative um, in, in those cases. And, and the fact that the breeders cup is so inviting, I think is the reason why we've seen pretty much every breeders cup we've seen an international uh, an international horse win and i can almost guarantee you, you could probably cut that number in half if that extra stipend wasn't there you'd probably not see a lot of these horses cuz they'd say you know what look we talk about it instead of maybe sending my horse to whatever keeneland or santa anita uh, for a chance to win a 6 million why don't we just send uh, the horse down to uh, you know dubai and in a grade 3 there the purse is going to be 15 million, uh, you know, so, so it kind of does open it up because look, I think these horse owners and the connections, they want to put their horses up against the best in the world to kind of, so we don't see it too often. You know, it's not like other sports where you have a schedule, right? The Before the season starts, you know who you're going to play this and that for a lot of these connections, they know, okay, I want to start this race. Everything goes well. We'll be here, there, here, and there. Even in a perfect world, you might know your schedule, but you don't know what your opponent's schedule or, you know, how you're going to be. And sometimes we do see some horses. This is the fourth time that we've seen um, these two go at it, you know, Mage and um, trying to think of, you know, who, whoever would have been, you know, one of the uh, the horses running in the Triple Crown this year that'll be running in the Derby. Uh, this will be their third or fourth matchup this year alone. Um, so it's really, really interesting. And obviously the timing of it, um, the horse racing season will continue, obviously, after the Breeders' Cup. That's when, of course, Del Mar gets rolling. Um, but it is kind of the unofficial end of the season. Everything kind right. of resets. I believe the first big race 
after the Breeders' Cup um, and may have already gone off before the Breeders' Cup will actually be a Kentucky Derby challenge race. I believe it's the, you know, the, the futurity somewhere. Um, but, you know, it's a 25 point race um, that gets us ready for, you know, the first Saturday in May. We're already looking ahead essentially to 2024. So kind of the unofficial end of the season, but certainly not the end of horse racing. Uh, but it is kind of the end of the top echelon horses running. They kind of look towards the January, February, March side of things. I will say, keep an eye, obviously, on the juveniles. It's it's very difficult. Uh, I'll be the first one to admit I am not good uh, handicapping two-year-olds. I don't know how many are, honestly. It's very difficult, especially at this level. But keep an eye on it because you're going to see some of these horses running in either – the juvenile Phillies or the juveniles that are going to have eyes on either the Kentucky Oaks or the Kentucky Derby respectfully. Uh, and then obviously the triple crown going forward. So these future star Fridays today, they're two year olds, but obviously next year they will be essentially kind of in that spotlight of the Derby, the Derby prep and all that stuff. And that's kind of how horse racing goes. You, you get through the breeders cup and then you immediately start to focus on those challenge races. And then obviously this, is it the Pegasus World Cup? I think is the yes. first real big one at Gulfstream in maybe January or early February. And then Saudi has some shine. Um, and then we we really get rolling in to, to March and April. But any yeah, other you mentioned the you mentioned the Phillies. And yes. uh, you know, folks, I'm gonna give you a little behind the scenes. Sometimes you would think that Brandon and I are on the phone or texting and we have all this back and forth and we have this great dialogue all planned for you. We pretty much are doing this all off the cuff. But yeah. because we are so in tune with one another, he talks about the Phillies, and my next bullet point was about juvenile Phillies. So here's the deal with the juvenile Phillies. Whoever wins the juvenile Phillies usually gets year-end honors uh, for that category. And only two horses, horse named Open Mine in 88 and another one, Silver Bullet Day in 98, have won the BC Juvenile and then gone on to win the Kentucky Oaks, or vice versa, won the Kentucky Oaks and then won the, the Juvenile Phillies. Last in 2021, when Brandon and I were in attendance at Del Mar, Echo Zulu won that race. And it was like, wow, that was a great race. It was fun to be there to watch Echo Zulu run and got year-end honors and went on to the Kentucky Oaks in 2022 and then finished in fourth place. Ran last year, uh, 2022 Breeders' Cup in the Philly Mare Sprint, came in second. So, again, you never know what's going to happen in thoroughbred racing. And far and few between are the flight lines, the American Pharaohs. So when you do have a chance to watch one of those thoroughbreds run, you're really seeing something special. And it goes beyond the uh, $6 million you're running for on that Breeders' Cup Classic or that $2 million in one of the, the big juvenile races. I, I looked this up just to give a, an example. American Pharaoh. American Pharaoh had all the accolades, best thoroughbred to run in, in possibly since 2000. And, and the stud fee for American Pharaoh, $200,000 per bull. $200,000. It was some grandiose number they said by the time he's done his first year of studying probably going to bring in 34 million bucks or some ridiculous number like that it's like well, so think beyond the race and the finish line it's what comes after that flight line still going to get a great stud fee great breeding fee but imagine if flight line could have run three more years won a couple more breeders cup races the the value just goes up and up and up and up yeah, it's still, for me personally, it will be one of the biggest regrets for me. I had tickets to uh, the Pacific yes, Classic and um, without getting too deep into it, you know, had a little bit of uh, some some adult beverages on uh, the Friday night before. And, uh, you know, hey, sometimes you have a little bit much the next morning, you're feeling it. Um, I think it was about 110 degrees that day. I mean, hot, like hot for San Diego. Um, and I just said, you know what, I'm not going to go. I'm going to eat the tickets. I'll watch the race at home. And I remember watching that race and watching Flightline do its thing and, uh, and thinking in that exact moment, you just missed out on history. Um, it, it, and that's really 
what it was. Um, I'll go back, uh, you know, even Z when Zenyatta ran at Del Mar, obviously all that stuff. Um, and I think actually lost. Uh, it was a big upset. But anyways, didn't really have the, the wherewithal back then. I wasn't too deep into horse racing, but that will still be one of the biggest regrets, at least for me personally. And then I understand it. You kind of just brought up American Pharaoh, essentially just standing in stud, doing his thing, $34 million, very low risk. You can understand why flight line, you know, they said, hey, thank you. We're, we're going to ride off into the sunset uh, and, and make our money on this side of it. So I do wonder, you know, I, I'm maybe it's the pessimist in me, uh, but I, I do hope that maybe that doesn't fully become, you know, the the rule rather than the exception. I, I do want to see horses. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of uh, oh, the, the horse. Mm. Darn it. Um, one, one a few years back, they called him the old man. Whitmore. Was it Whitmore? I think that horse was a nine or 10 year old. Um, and I think one, you know, maybe in like 2015 and then came back and won in 2020. So I, I hope that we, you know, still see those horses running at that top level. Um, and then I can confirm, or at least uh, from what I've seen, that this does sound like Cody's wish. Uh, it will be. Cody's wish last race, uh, last race will be at the Breeders Cup. Looks like it will be the Dirt Mile, not the Classic, which did surprise me. But um, you know, much smarter people are in charge there uh, than me, so we'll, that will be the last time we've seen Cody's wish. And 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 Cody's wish has been a horse that's been racing for three, four, five years. Um, but I, I think the 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 point I was just trying to kind of hammer home was like, I just hope we don't see some of these three year olds have great seasons, um, and then you know, do the smart thing. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's kind of like college athletics, right? Like I want this kid to play for four full, full four years, but if you can go make your millions, go make your millions. Um, so, yeah. you, so it's, it, it's unfortunate, you know, you're selfish to get mad at it. Um, you understand the reasons, but flight line last year for me will still be one of those memories um, that will be etched in my mind of that, horse being that much dominant that much more dominant i should say than all the other horses so and you can put any of those thoroughbreds on the track and they're probably if you put them in the in the starter gate and it opened up they would just take off running of course and yep. who knows if they would really you know muscle memory would they run around the track would they just sprint and then pull up going into that first turn they don't do what they do without those other superstars that are involved in this and that is the jockey and again uh, I'm not telling anybody anything new who has ever followed the game of horse racing or stood in the paddock area of any racetrack. But for those of you who may not be that familiar, let me tell you, when you look at a, a an 1,100-pound animal or a 1,000-pound animal, and then you look at a guy who is maybe 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, and weighs all of uh, 105, 110 pounds, climb on the back of that and realize you are going in these races, the Breeders' Cup races, they have 14 starters max per race, 12 on some of the turf races, but 14 horses side by side, the bells ring, the gates open up, and all of a sudden you've got all that tons of firepower, and you've got these 110-pound guys uh, controlling them, weaving in and out. Uh, it's, a, it's a show to watch these guys drive NASCAR and Formula One. And that's dangerous. But these guys on the backs of these thoroughbreds, one wrong move, fall off that horse, and they've got six coming behind them. And that's a, it's really something to watch. So, and, and you're going to see nothing but the all stars. It's going to be Mike Smith, the most winning jockey at the Breeders' Cup. You're going to see Juan Hernandez, uh, the Ortiz brothers are going to be there, Irad and, and his brother Jose. You're going to see Tyler Gaffalone just wow it just makes you go wow when you see all those guys at one spot joe bravo of course is going to run flavian pratt umberto rispoli they're all going to be there and that alone is worth just watching these guys go smile past everybody as they go by get on their horse and then uh, watch them run the race win or lose they're off their horses back in the jockey's room and changing putting on a set of silks uh, quite a group of athletes and that's the thing that gets me um the the focus the preparation that these jockeys have to put in um 
you know, I think even now personally myself, I've never ridden a horse. I love horses. I think they're beautiful. But if I'm being completely honest, they scare the ever, ever living bleep out of me because that's an animal that if he decides I don't want that person to be standing there, I won't be standing there any longer. Um, and once again, uh, it's a healthy, respectful fear. Uh, but, you know, I've seen people ride horses and, you know, it's not easy. It's it's not comfortable in the best case trail riding right like just kind of just walking down a trail we're not talking about this uh it, it, it's you brought up formula one it's it's almost like formula one drivers racing seven eight different tracks in one day and you have 20 minutes to remember how you're going to run this race you know you got guys like mike smith okay you're going to start the day on this horse you know, horse A is a, is a horse that I want to be out at the front. You know, I also, you know, the horses behind me, I got to watch out for this horse getting here. You have all that in your head. The race goes off. Boom. You, you know, you win. Maybe you do an interview, you take pictures, blah, blah, blah. It's almost, if you win, it's like a curse because you just lost five, 10 minutes of kind of getting your mind right for the next one. It blows my mind all that they have to not only process during the race, but before the race in such a small, I mean, I have trouble keeping track of the program sitting in the stands, let alone these guys who have to ride these uh, horses and their adrenaline's going crazy. And one other person I do want to, and not just one person, but um, kind of the unsung heroes. And I'll, I'll say the track announcers. Now, personally here <laughs> myself, um, <laughs> Del Mar, Trevor Denman is is the face or is the I should say the voice of horse racing for me. I mean, and away they go is it, it, that's that's three of maybe the best words ever um, for me. Of course, in that kind of uh, I don't know if he's New Zealand or Australian, and I know they get very very testy when you mix those up. So I apologize if you're listening, Mister Denman. But um, that that not only that, but for them. They're having to call a race with essentially, you know, five, 600 feet away. And all the only markers are essentially silks, just colors that change every single race. So the amount of effort they put in as well to keep us uh, kind of aware of what's going on. And very rarely, I mean, I don't think I've ever heard of a slip up from Trevor Denman and uh, I, I do apologize. Um, Larry Colmus is the other gentleman who's mainly the Breeders' Cup guy. And he did fill in during COVID for Trevor Denman um, at Del Mar. But Larry Colmus is another one. And all the track announcers, apologies. I, those are really the only two that I know off the top of my head. Um, a lot of effort goes into that. But Absolutely. You know, NFL, you've got spotters that watch the ball and where they're going to put it down. And producers whisper, in your you know, ear. I, I, you whisper it to me and I tell everybody, well, it's going to be put down on the 36 yard line. Yeah. Like I'm some kind of genius that's paying attention. These guys sit there with their binoculars and they're watching these horses go. They're calling the quarter pole. They're calling the half. They're calling the, the far turn. They're calling. And then when it's a, a dead heat, my goodness, sometimes these guys are, I don't know how they, they do it. As you're saying, I don't know how they do it. Must be exhausted by the end of the session. Yeah. It's, like I said, I feel like at that point, you know, race ends or the final race ends, you put your microphone down and you just kind of like sink into your seat, you know, maybe light up a cigarette and pour yourself a, uh, a glass of scotch and just like, wow, that was crazy. I think um, we have to say makers the, mark when we're talking Breeders' Cup. Yeah, that's fair. Makers, yes. The, 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 the sponsor. Sponsor uh, of the Breeders' always. Cup. They were great, great hosts when we went. Um, whew, I'm not a big... Uh, whiskey guy um but you know taking taking some samples and it was nice to kind of taste okay hey you know there is a difference in taste in these whiskeys i'm just kind of used to hey give me the well whiskey uh with you know a coke back or whatever but uh any other uh thoughts uh raider jim i think we pretty much hit on it probably the one other group and we should not ignore them again we talked about the the thoroughbreds we talked about the athletes who are the jockeys and we do have to go ahead and, and give a shout out to the Stonich group, to the Godolphins of the world, the, the owners of these horses. And then, of course, we'd be remiss to not talk about Doug O'Neill, Phil D'Amato, uh, Bob Baffert, no matter what your opinions are on Bob Baffert. He's going to be there competing. Uh, you, you're going to see uh, 
Sadler's going to be there. So many. Brad Cox will be there. Wow. Again, it's just, it is the who's who of thoroughbred racing. And that just makes the energy all that much more exciting. I remember last time I was just mentioning it at home the other day. Yeah, last time when I was walking out of the Breeders' Cup, all of a sudden Bobby Flay went walking past me mm -hmm. because he had his, uh, his one of his horses that was competing that day. I don't know if he's got a horse in there or not this year, but uh, it will also be because it's at Santa Anita. I assure you it will be the who's who of uh, the casual horse race fan, but it's trendy for uh, La La Land to get out there and really make a presence. So can't imagine who you might see walking around. Yeah, great, great uh, final thoughts there. But yeah, I and I will say this, just looking over the numbers, I think it's more of not a matter of if, but when um, we do see Bob Baffert um, overtake D. Wayne Lucas for that top, uh, I mean, I think he's two back right now. D. Wayne Lucas has 20, um, Baffert has 18. And I, I just myself personally, I generally see more Baffert horses than D. Wayne Lucas. He's definitely still doing his thing, but it's the Breeders' Cup and it's getting to that point. And it's not technically Breeders' Cup week, but just kind of breaking this down, breaking down, um, you know, the, the early part of it last week and even taking right now just a really quick little glance at the pre-entries. Uh, it kind of gets the blood flowing, the, the, the juices flowing, if you will. And uh, the one thing about the Breeders' Cup uh, compared to the Super Bowl is I've always said the Super Bowl is like a roller coaster at an amusement park. You wait in line for four hours for a 30-second to a minute ride. And with the NFL, you get two weeks of pregame, essentially. I mean, NFL Network, the entire lead-up is essentially a pregame show for a three-hour game. It's kind of the opposite for the Breeders' Cup. Uh, it, it, you know, talked about a little bit, you know, once the, the entries and post positions are put out when everybody can kind of dive in and break it down and you kind of cram it, uh, in, in those times and you get really do get it, savor it over those two days, but any other final thoughts, Raider Jim, before we wrap this up? No, let's just hope that we have a very safe Breeders' Cup weekend when it does take place. I'm going to keep my eyes on the press and in the media because there were some things online just this week about uh, they were talking about the horse racing uh, integrity and safety act and how is it really doing what it's supposed to do and there was chatter amongst some horse people about uh, you know I, there, there's a track that's in question and i don't know which track but they were saying if this would have been one individual if this would have been one trainer if this would have been one ownership group there would have been sanctions and all kinds of things why is it the track isn't getting suspended? I don't know. So I'm going to be curious to see, will they have a turnout of protesters on Friday? And is that going to take away at all in any way? Uh, in LA, you can't, you can't escape it anywhere. But if you're in one of the hearts of media, which is Los Angeles, you're going to have to cover that if you're out there with signs. Yeah, I think that's something that, you know, we... Look, this is America. Everyone has a right to pe peacefully protest. I respect that. Um, obviously, even if I don't fully agree, but at the same time, I, I do believe at the end of the day, there those protesters and all that stuff. I, I would I would like to hope, you know, they're out there for the for the safety and well being of the horses, and and I respect that. Um, but I I do also know that there the people that work in horse racing, especially at this level. Um, these, everyone involved, or I don't want to say that broad of a term, but 99.9% .9 of the people involved at this level truly do love horses, uh, love the equine, um, sport overall. And there's just so much time effort that gets put into this. Um, we kind of broke a little bit of it down and we just kind of scratched the surface, but there's a lot of effort time and, uh, you know, even even the groundskeepers and things like that, they they take that stuff to heart. You know, if something happens, a horse breaks down on the track, you know, they feel it. They, you know, maybe I, did I miss a spot, you know, kind of raking over where the, the starting gate left or stuff like that. So I, I, that's my big thing that I always when I tell people I'm a horse racing fan, they all some people, oh, this and that. And like I said, I understand where they're coming from. I don't necessarily agree with them, um, but. I, I love this sport and I know the people, a uh, high, high majority of people in this sport love horses and uh, animals as well. Hopefully I will say I, I did hop on to the, to the horsing, horse racing and uh, safety and integrity acts website. 
nice website. Um, just doesn't seem like a lot's getting done. Uh, you know, it's a lot of kind of, it, it almost felt like a, um, um, a campaign website, uh, a lot of promises. Um, but you know, hopefully that can kind of get rolling, um, and, and we can see some uniformity and, and we can hopefully come together, uh, a, a, and fix the way horse racing has gone. Because unfortunately, if you have followed us, you know, earlier this year, there were some tough times at Churchill, right. uh, there. So hopefully. And back before it was passed, I remember I reached out to one of the communications directors for the congressman out of New York who was sponsoring the bill, one of the co-sponsors of the bill, got right back to me, had a great conversation with him, gave me a lot of information. Since it has gone into place, I have made at minimum four attempts to get a response from that office to say, so what's really happening? What do you guys really have in place? Who else can I really talk to that's willing to give me some information? And I get absolutely no response. Matter of fact, one of them was, hey, you're uh, you're not in our jurisdiction, you know, in our in our voting area. So you should reach out to the representative where you are. So I guess I can reach out to Juan Vargas and ask him what he knows. Uh, real quick, one more thing. You might see us early next week. Who knows? You might see us Tuesday. You might see us Wednesday. Uh, but I am looking at the schedule for sure. Monday, October 30th, they're saying, unless I have the wrong date, but I don't think I That's do. Correct. Uh, it is going to be the post draw for all the races. So it's going to be late afternoon. I think it's so 7.30 to 9.30, but I leave that's Eastern Standard Time. So it's going to be 4.30 to 6.30. It will be happening over here. And uh, then we'll be able to tell you who's really running in which race and what time. And uh, maybe even we'll give you some tips on who we think you should bet on. And then Definitely. just do the opposite. <laughs> no, this isn't NFL. This oh, is at right. the NFL. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're still in that NFL mindset, the opposite NFL mindset. But now, once again, obviously, horse racing is not quite the same as regular other sports gambling. You know, you don't have to necessarily – your horse don't need to cross first for you to to win. We count a win is if you go to the to the booth and, uh, and cash in a ticket. But, yeah, so it does sound like more than likely the, the, um, the PPs and the entries will be kind of finalized. We'll get morning lines. Uh, more than likely Tuesday morning. So it will more than likely be a two-part episode, break down the of juveniles, course. and then break down um, the Saturday slate with, of course, the cl culminating in the classic. But with that being said, thank you all so much for listening to this special episode of the original Call to Post presented by the first Off the Bench podcast network. Everyone comes off the bench. We are first. It's time for y'all to go wash your hands. And please, 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 Stop hating everyone. We'll talk to you all very soon. Take care.